Okay, now let's talk about Asajj Ventris and General Grievous. Uh, these are two characters that we already knew because of the Gendi Tartakovsky series, the um, experiment that that series was. Um, you know, it may not have be uh, officially declared as G-level canon, but nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of good material within that fertile ground for the further development um, of what is now becoming canonical. Uh, but yeah, it's most certainly a stage of interest and um, General Grievous uh, basically are fully fleshing out more of the motivations of uh, not only uh, Palpatine slash Darth Sidious, uh, but also Count Dooku and uh, the Sith as well, the whole Sith Order. And we see the way that the, that the Count and Sidious coming, you know, if you, if you go up start at the highest chain of command being Sidious down to Dooku down to his two underlings. Um, you have one that's in, more in charge of the army, uh, Grievous being the cyborg in charge of the, um, the general of the um, droid army, and then Asajj as his own personal assassin. Now I know a lot of casual viewers just assume that she's a Sith because she looks creepy and wields lightsabers red ones at that, um, but I, I do feel like um, in getting away from the, the solid blacks and whites and the, you know, good versus bad element that the original trilogy was, um, I mean, that's one of the problems that you have. Uh, you know, I personally prefer that, uh, and the ambiguity and the grades of, um, you know, maybe characters who want to be a certain thing, and they're not quite there because of this or that. Um, but that's the interesting thing about Asajj, as we have seen develop from the feature film through now to season three. If you saw the Night Sisters trilogy, that was an amazing look at her character. Up until that point, she was the hairless harpy, as Ahsoka referred to her. And she, we loved watching her uh, kick off her banter with Obi-Wan back and forth, and um, really menace the Jedi characters. Uh, but, you know, you can only do that so many times before it becomes still. And, wow, they knocked it out of the park once they tore into her backstory and made her a sympathetic character. Um, so, we're taking a character who was uh, po a, a possibility for being the baddie of Episode 2. Uh, she got put away on, you know, filed away in favor of focusing on Count Dooku instead, but um, bringing her in as kind of a, a somewhat rogue element. You know, she has her master, Dooku, but at the same time, she's, um, you know, she, we get the idea that she has her own agenda, too, and certainly when we find out her heritage and um, how she had once been a Jedi and um, has continuously been an orphan ever since, whether she was with the Jedi or now with the Sith. And she's about to be orphaned again when Dooku um, displaces her and cuts ties. Um, but that was very important because it shows us, you know, after he receives instruction from Sidious to cut her loose, and he just does it with no, no um, amount of, um, you know, he's very cold and calculated about it. There, there's no feeling there, it seems like. He's very detached. Um, that shows us how the Sith operate. Uh, you know, as a Sith, you've always got to try to keep rising up through the ranks. You're always on guard, um, even from those that you trust the most. Um, so, and, and we've seen that brilliantly executed at the beginning of Episode 3, where um, Palpatine is just crying out for Dooku to be uh, finished off. Just right there. And just, you see that betrayal, uh, that same betrayal that Dooku experiences at Palpatine's feet at the beginning of Episode 3 is the same situation that Asajj is in in the Night Sisters trilogy. Um, so it's all about, you know, it's kind of a given that you're going to um, possibly be cut down by your master once you rise up too high. But that's the whole idea is that um, you know, if you are a strong enough person, survival of the fittest, uh, you will evade that threat and be able to then conquer your master and take that master's place. Um, so that's the way the whole rule of two operates. 
I know that that whole concept gained a lot of controversy after episode one was released because people thought, well, why would you want to limit yourself like that? The Sith are so incredibly cool. Why would you want to say, well, there can only ever be two in the universe? That's hogwash. That's not, um, you know, people who are casual fans read things too literally. They hear a character say something and they assume that's a blanket statement for everything. Uh, you know, the real um, uh, idea behind it is that, um, you know, it's just a um, continuous cycle between student and master, each one deposing the last. Um, it's not to say that there can't be um, multiple uh, factions that maybe rogue factions. You know, we don't know at this point how organized the Sith Order is, but uh, you know, her character has brought a lot of interest to um, the series and to the prequel era because of her interactions with all the major characters. In General Grievous, as I mentioned in the written article, um, is very um, cowardly, but at the same time, he's very fearsome. He is a you know, skull-faced um, cyborg who. Um, we, we know is incredibly powerful. It's only when he knows he's outwitted that, um, or outmatched that he will seek escape. Um, but, uh, you know, we've also begun to feel for him because we know um, that Sidious views him as, and Dooku as well, they both view uh, uh, Grievous as being a disposable um, pawn that they can use to kind of clear the board clear out all the opposition and then they'll, you know, let him be killed off and then they can have full power without him wanting a stake in any of the action on down the line. So anyway, um, yeah, that, that sums up this entry and uh, be sure to check back tomorrow for um, the next items on my list. Until then, may the Force be with you.